Now we have the presentation that I'll tell you from Monica Lopez from Barcelona. Uh, she's going to talk to us what students did while they were in their homes. So Monica, if you want, hello Monica, hi there, hello. welcome. Hello everyone, <laughs> hi, <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Hola, buenas tardes, gracias por haber aceptado nuestro reto. Y si quieres puedes empezar, cuando quieras. Okay, um, I'm going to switch off my camera so you don't get distracted with my face. Okay, me too. And, so. <laughs> <laughs> and so I will start projecting. Please um, let me know if you have any difficulties in hearing or viewing any of the materials. Okay, uh, fine. So here we go. Okay, can you see? Yes, that's fine. That's fine, Christine. That's fine, Monica. You can go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so how many languages live in your house and in your city? Collaborative linguistic landscape during and post COVID-19. This is a project that we carried out. And for me, it's a teaching and learning experience, a very important one, because it's the first time I've been dealing with this topic. And I think that in the end, um, my students enjoy it a lot. So let's start with that. Uh, this teaching and learning experience was addressed to year five and year six students, that is uh, fifth graders and sixth graders in primary education at the school Purificació Salas Chandri School in San Quirce de Vallès, uh, Barcelona. Um, students were guided to carry out a research-based learning to discover their linguistic landscapes at home and in their cities during and after COVID lockdown. With their findings, the learners created some videos, collage and word clouds to share their results with their classmates and the teacher, which was me in this case. This learning experience also offered room for reflection and is willing because it's not finished yet to help students draw some conclusions once the whole process is completed throughout uh, the current scholar year. What am I going to show you today? Well, this is basically what I'm going to show you. I'm going to share with you the objectives, the tasks briefly, the tasks that I designed and I presented to my students. I'm also going to show you some of, some of my students' outcomes, productions, and also reflections. And finally, um, I will show you my own reflection, uh, which have guided me, thanks to Melinda, Dolly, and Claudia, my Erasmus team uh, at the UAB, to start designing the roadmap for this uh, school year. What's next? Okay. So the objectives, the learning objectives of this learning experience are six. First of all, to carry out some research so students can experience what research is, uh, share their findings, their research findings, be aware of one's linguistic context, raise language awareness and critical thinking, uh, start thinking about the role of languages in society, why some languages are more visible or less visible, why some languages are invisible. Well, start thinking about this and also improve uh, their digital competence. The fact that um, this project was carried out during lockdown, everything was um, transferred digitally. And for this reason, students needed to improve their digital competence. And I think we did a good job. Okay, so as for the tasks, in total, uh, I presented three tasks via Google Classroom and students were asked to do um, them as um, challenges, okay? And these tasks contained very detailed information as well as um, teachers modeling and also uh, tutorials to help them perform as good as possible 
because as I told you, um, the lockdown was not easy and some students um, struggled a little bit to understand uh, all the instructions. So a lot of visual support, tutorials and models were provided to help them. Here is task one. As I told you, um, it was presented as a challenge because um, we thought that this way they would be more motivated. And the first task is presented through a question. Who can find the most languages at home? Create your linguistic landscape at home collage. Um, the three tasks that I'm presenting today follow the same design somehow. So I'm going to show you the teaching materials through task one. And if we, I have time, I will show you task two and task two teaching material as well. But if not, at least you can see uh, a good example and you can more or less uh, guess the way the other tasks look. This is the teaching material for task one. I used a Google presentation. And through the Google presentation, I introduced the topic with a heading, Linguistic Landscape at Home, the challenge, as you can see here. And because this was the first time that my students um, were in touch with linguistic landscape, the, the term, the idea of linguistic landscape, I presented a very brief and concrete definition so they would know what um, they are doing. And this is the definition that I offered. A linguistic landscape is a number of languages that are visible or not in a place. So again, I present the key question, how many languages live in your house? And we thought about uh, using these questions because they were uh, locked down, they couldn't go out, and it was a great excuse to uh, do some research in the houses. I presented um, a video with my own linguistic landscape in my house as a model so students could um, refer to it or create a video similar to mine. I'm not going to show you my video because I'm going to show you one of my students' video, which I think is much more interesting and it's quite similar to what I presented. And then I offer some guidance referring to previous um, artistic productions they created uh, last year in autumn. Um, I refer to that to help them create the collage. In case they forgot how to do it, they could um, bring that back to mind. And to finish all the tasks, okay, um, I'm constantly repeating what they have to do, as you can see. And also I try to uh, show all the steps in a very clear way with simple instructions, tutorials, for example, how to upload photos on um, their drive or how to create a collage. I also recorded some uh, screens, screens to show them how to do it. And as you can see, the teaching material was crucial uh, to guide students to perform um, in a good way. And of course, more modeling. I show them my collage, very simple, not to, to avoid some students getting frustrated. So it was not, I'm not too demanding because they were at home and emotionally, well, it was difficult. And, and then because these are all the languages that I found in my house and I explain where they are on my video, I pose again a little challenge. Can you believe it? I found 13 languages. Uh, can you find more languages in your house? And to conclude, all the tasks present um, a checklist to help them make sure that they complete all the steps and that they do all the different parts of the task so they don't get lost. It's like a self-assessment tool and also to keep them on task. Once I present these through Google Classroom, they can mm, ask me questions, of course, and they hand in their productions. So here we can see what they did, what my students do, mm, did 
after presenting task one. Here we can see my students collage. Each of them are different. Some of them included the languages they found at home, as you can see here with some photos. And it was very interesting uh, to see that they included like the music lang language, for example, or Thai language, Chinese. Others only found Spanish, Catalan and English, which was quite surprising. And well, that goes on and on. Uh, they also created some videos, not all of them. It was an optional task. And I like to share with you one of the videos. It's very short and it's similar to my, my model. Hope the sound is good. Spanish and here is a book in Spanish about science and science. But we also have books in English that I recognize that I have not read these books yet. But I think that with quarantine time, I will have time to read some of them. And here we have some tickets of a museum because about two years ago I went to, to French to Normandy with my father. And here we have some pasta, some spaghetti that I don't know why, but here it's a little text in Portuguese. And when I was looking for some languages in my house, I looked to the fridge and I saw this manga that it's from Asturias, so it's my name is Asturias. And also I saw this other manga that I like so much. I think that it's because it's so colorful. And this, this magnet, it's from China, as you can see. And we have it because about 10 years ago, my father go, went to, to China and he liked it so much. So he will this moment. Okay, and she goes on and on, and I'm going to stop because maybe you had a, an idea of what the linguistic and landscape video was about. And she did really well, and from her contribution, many ideas came to my mind and helped me have new ideas for this uh, school year, and I hope to to cover these new ideas. So going back to my presentation, uh, together my students and I, we created a document with all the languages they found in their houses. And well, as you can see, there are many of them. Hmm? As for task two, who can find the most languages in the city, um, was a task that we, pre we presented a few weeks after in May when students were able to go out for a walk for an hour a day. And I took advantage of this situation and I asked them to reproduce what they had done at home, now do it in their cities. And well, the teaching material is very similar to the previous one. You can see the Google presentation. I posted that on the Google Classroom. I created a video to present the task, so the task was more, you know, varied. It's not only about reading, it's they could um, follow the instructions by listening to me. And I also 
took advantage of the video to say congratulations to them because they did a great job with their linguistic landscape at home. I'm not going to stop too much. It's, it follows the same structure. And for task two, these are my students' productions. Um, the collage about the linguistic landscape in their cities. And also some of them are very creative um, you know, very attractive. And most of them just posted the image that represented the different languages. Others wrote the name of the language and only found Catalan, Spanish and English, which was quite shocking, but uh, there we go. And well, you can see very nice ones, very nice collage, very interesting collage. And represented the different languages. Others wrote the name of the language and only found Catalan, Spanish, and English, which was. I can hear my voice. Okay, now I continue. There was some um, interference. And we created this um, list of the languages they found in their city. Okay, we found Arabic, Catalan, Chinese, English, French, German, graffiti. They included graffiti as a language. Greek, Italian, Japanese, numbers. They thought that numbers are part of the linguistic um, landscape. The sign language as well. Traffic signs, music language, Punjabi, especially in restaurants. Well, all together, very interesting. And we moved to a task three in which there was, well, we thought Melinda, Claudia and myself thought it was important to find some moment for reflection, even though we were away from each other. So in task three, I asked them to reflect about their discoveries. And then I asked them to create a word cloud with words from the languages that um, they found more intriguing, okay? and. I'm going to show you the results, the outcomes. For I'm going to go show you first the word clouds very quickly. Here we have uh, a collection of word clouds. I asked them to write the words in that language in English first and then find the translation into the language they chose. And this is what they created. Japanese, Turkish, then somebody started changing the shape, Welsh. It was really interesting, that one. Latin, well, Romanian, etc. And more sh different shapes and French, different languages. And I also asked optionally to record the words that they selected from the language that they found more catchy. So it was very interesting and I think they really had a good time doing these tasks. Although I must confess that creating the word cloud was not easy and it was challenging for them. And a lot of tutorials were needed and we found a problem, a difficulty more than a problem. Some of the alphabets were difficult to be represented in the word cloud because the app that we were using did not include all the alphabets. And for the reflection time, I asked them to answer a Google form. I have it open here. I think I'm gonna go faster. And there were different questions. For example, select the languages that intrigue you the most. That was important because then from that they could select and create the word cloud. And we have the answers here. Chinese is one of the most chosen. English, Italian, Japanese. Um, Russian, Korean, Welsh, <laughs> there it is. 
Very interesting. Uh, another question is, which language uh, you didn't expect to see in your city? And they said Arabic, they said Greek. None of them, well, most of them didn't expect to find Greek in the city. It was very, very interesting. And well, we continue asking them questions, which is the most common language and why? Some students answer with a very interesting um, language in English, but I guess that their parents help them to do so. This one, for example, he or she said, I think the most common is Catalan or Spanish because all the people understand and speak these languages. And also because all the traffic signs are in Catalan. So if you don't understand Catalan or Spanish, you have a big problem. And reading this is fascinating and really, really interesting. And we go on and on asking questions. Um, for example, is there a particular reason why a language is more or less used? Explain why. And yes, they say, for example, here, yes. Um, let me see. Japanese, because there are very few people who speak this language in, in sorry, is a very, is very fra, far from Catalonia. Depending on where you are, one language is spoken more than another. Well, as you can see, it's, this is a very rich material that I try to explode this year with my students. And now it's time to, well, I'm reaching the end right now. So these are my, well, some of the reflections that I, I'm thinking about and are helping me to plan this school year. First, because of the lockdown teaching conditions, this learning experience lacked of face-to-face -face interactions and more time for reflection and conclusion would have enriched the task. This is what I think, and this is what I want to achieve this year with them in class. A high percentage of students showed interest towards the task and said that they liked them. So that was very rewarding. And we, well, they referred to this. Now in class, last week, we were talking about this. They um, referred to this, so it's fantastic. Once we got back to school in September, students remembered the task and expressed interest in continuing developing the topic. So this is good for me to carry on developing it. So I, I know that they are interested. With my Erasmus team, Melinda and Claudia, we agreed on designing follow-up activities where students show their expertise to new ones and are given more voice and choice when creating the final product. So I expect to have their voice and their choice more present in this year. And another reflection, the last one is the discovering the school linguistic landscape will empower students because they will be aware of what languages they know, what languages their classmates know and why they are visible or not. Well, critical thinking, etc. I think that uh, it's a tool to make a students invisible languages visible. And therefore, my roadmap for this current school year planning is, as you can see here, we, we are going to try that our students share their findings with new students, new students in third cycle. We are going to try that the new students start linguistic landscapes research at home and in their city in the same way my previous students did. Um, they will, the previous students will start a new research on our school linguistic landscape. We are going to discover the languages that live in our school, which languages are spoken by our students. Are they visible? Are they invisible? We are going to do this if we can. And we are going to analyze the results and the conclusions. Now that we can be face to face, we will take advantage of that to work deeper on this issue. And of course, another objective for this year is to promote artistic production with the guidance of the local artist, Paula Vito. So our students will become artists and will present the, their findings, their linguistic landscapes through an artistic production. And well, this is all. Thank you. Gracias. Muchas gracias a tu Tom. And hope you like it. And if you have any questions, um, they are more than welcome. I'm sorry if I spoke more than 15 minutes. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Monica, for your presentation. It was very interesting and lots of food for thought. Indeed, we have um, in the in the chat. I noticed that we have some teacher students, so I think that uh, they will be interesting in uh, catching on on your ideas and doing something that uh, will help them explore linguistic landscapes at home. If we have the the possibility to start from home, then going to the city and going to the school. It's very, it's very interesting. I have um, lots of questions to make you, but I think that I'll, I'll leave it to the question and answer time. And um, so I think that since we are 